So just uh, to sum up on the PPP and IFE for forecasting exchange rates, are these useful for the long term or the short term? PPP for, for forecasting, does that help us to forecast the exchange rate in the long term or the short term? When we looked at forecasting exchange rates, where did we see PPP on the on the document? In which in which part of the document did we see PPP? Hmm? Can anybody remember what was what affects the exchange rate in the short term? It wasn't a question on your test. <coughs> Speculators, what expect? Following trends, right? How do investors feel? Investor sentiment. Short run determinants. Where do we see PPP? PPP inflation is long term. What's a medium term? Monetary policy, interest rate differential. Okay? Economic growth. Current account. So if you like, you can, now that we're finished, you could read back over this document. It also talks about parity conditions. It's a little bit difficult, but if you like the challenge, you can read it. It talks about the PPP parity. Right, so we have, they asked the traders what effects in the short term and in the long term, right? Speculative forces, bandwagon effects, short term. So PPP. What are we talking about? When I say PPP, what are we talking about really? What are we talking about with these two models? PPP and IFE, what are, what are we talking about? What are we using to predict the exchange rate? PPP. Inflation. Okay. PPP means purchasing power parity, the change in prices is inflation. Okay. So neither of these models is good for short-term forecasting. Both of the models work better for the long-term. So they are good indicators of the long-term exchange rate. So low inflation currencies will, over the long-term, <coughs> appreciate. Okay. So low. So high inflation currencies will depreciate. Low inflation currencies appreciate, okay? On the opposite way. Okay, so do you have any questions about this? We talked about the parity model, the PTP is the main one, and the IFE. In the end, both of them use the interest rate to predict. And we use the interest rate equation. No, no questions? The forecast. Yes. We, con we conclude the index of uh, natural disease and war. Yes. Uh, is calculate the risk premium. Uh, you mean for about the exchange rate? Yes. Yes. If you want, some economists do that. They go here and they put all of their numbers. They get numbers for all of these things and put them into numbers, right? Here you don't see any earthquake or natural disaster, right? Well, you could put here natural disaster might affect the exchange rate, right? If we have a natural disaster here, especially in the short term, right? Maybe the medium term, okay? Japan has the earthquake, so Japan, because it had the earthquake, had to do a very aggressive monetary policy, make their currency weaker, right? So Japan has some risk of an earthquake. So that's a good point. That's missing from here. Right? Natural disaster. But there's not too many countries that get big natural disasters. Japan is a rare case. UK doesn't have natural disasters. Euro area doesn't have natural disasters. <coughs> US might have a storm or a flood, but just in some small parts. US is a very big country. So I think Japan, the Japanese, Japanese currency is probably the only one which we would have natural disaster mainly. But we could put all of these numbers, and some economists do that. They put all a number for everything into the Excel, the computer. Da -da 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 -da. Right? And they may press enter. Da -da. The exchange rate next year will be. And they guess what the exchange rate will be next year or two years. Do you think they're accurate? No. Why not? 
which do you think is more accurate? All their calculations, putting everything into the computer, or just inflation? Or, or <laughs> inflation, right? Over the long term, inflation is the best indicator. Okay? Of the future exchange rate. Okay? So we can do all of that work. And we have hedge funds which trade currencies. They make some of them make reasonable profits, 10% a year, 15% a year. What it is, it's, a, it's people who sit in an office trading currencies. They make their plan, and then they trade the currency. And then at the end of the year, they make a profit, 10% or 15%. Okay? You give them your money. Instead of investing in stocks or investing in bonds, you give your money to the fund manager who's trading the foreign exchange, trading the currencies. Okay? Do you want to give your money to the fund manager trading the currencies? Hmm? We want to see. It. Let's have. We can have a look at a, a short look at a video with somebody who works for that kind of a fund. You can see uh, on CNBC they have a whole they have a whole uh, <coughs> section about uh, the currencies and and uh, predicting currencies. Do you know CNBC? Yes. <laughs> it's business news in the U.S., right? Yes. So they have a whole uh, kind of special part about predicting the currencies, right? So they have uh, news and, so, and uh, so on about that. So Anyway, we can we can find out that from the different uh, <coughs> forecasters, right? Here we have world's best forecaster, targets euro dollar parity. Do you understand parity? Yes. So they think it's going to be this one euro will be one dollar. So this is a, is a forecaster, right? So ING is, is a Dutch bank, okay? And they have been doing the best in their fund at. Uh, for predicting, they predict the future exchange rate, right? They are now predicting that the euro will get to get even uh, weaker, right? And go to parity with the dollar. So we have, um, in the next class I, can f I couldn't find quickly, but I can find a video of a hedge fund manager talking about that kind of thing, okay? So they, try, they use all of that and they try to predict what will happen, okay? If we are a company, are we going to get involved in that kind of trading and speculating on currencies as working for a company? Do you want to get involved in trading and speculating on currencies? Personally, you might do that. You can decide what to do with your money. You can invest in stocks, invest in bonds, give it to somebody to trade currencies, right? Which is better, do you think? Trading currencies by yourself at home on the Wanda trading platform? Or giving your money to some person who's been doing that for 30 years and made all the information and computer programs, which is better? You have to pay them a small fee, maybe 1%. Which is better? Second one, right? Probably. Okay? Give your money to the currency trader, okay? professional trader. Do you want to be a professional trader? Hmm? You, can, you need to get a license. You can get some stock trading license and you can join the bank and you could trade currencies or join the fund and you could trade currencies every day. Okay? Like Wanda. But with other people's money. Which is better? Trading currencies with other people's money or your own money? If you're a new worker and you don't work know much about it. <laughs> right? So the JP Morgan made that famous statement. You can make more money trading other people's money and getting a fee than trading your own money. Trade other people's money and charge them a fee 
is more profitable than trading your own money, making a profit. <laughs> right? So you can do that in, in the finance. So people do that. They look at all these things and they trade the currencies. But as a company, you're not interested in that. Okay? As a company, you're not interested in currency speculation. As a company, you're interested, you're doing exports or imports or trading, you want to have a stable situation. You want to do hedging, not speculation. Okay? So therefore, we use hedging situation and forward contracts. Okay? But there is this other market, which this course is more focused on that you'll be working for a company and you have to do hedging, understand about hedging and so on, rather than I'm not training you to be currency trader. Okay? If you want, this will help you to understand and later you can take the currency trading license if you're interested in that more specifically. So that moves us on to the next part of the course where we're going to try to talk about hedging and understanding better about the exposure, foreign exchange exposure, because if we're investing in stocks or if we're a company, we don't want to invest in currencies. We're not taking a risk on currencies. If we're investing in stocks, we're taking the risk on stocks. Okay? If we're doing business with another company, we want to make money by trading, not by currencies. Okay? So we want to eliminate currency risk, right? get rid of this exposure, foreign exchange exposure. So what is exposure? I'm exposed to the sun, I can get burnt. Okay? The foreign exchange exposure comes about when a firm or investor has an open position in a foreign currency. So if my arm is open, then I have an open position for the sun, right? So it just means I have some position with the foreign currency. Open position means currently unhedged, uncovered, not covered, subject to risk. So we should understand long and short, because if you listen to the business news, Bloomberg or CNBC, they often use long or short. Okay? Long or short is a short way to say what kind of position I have. If I have a house, do I want the house price to go up or go down? If I own a house. Go on. Go up. Actually, it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to sell the house anyway. If I'm just going to live in the house, it doesn't really matter, right? But let's say I have a second property, okay? I want the price to go up. Then I can sell it and get a profit, okay? Is that, do you think that's called a long or a short position? It's a long position, okay? Short is kind of more negative meaning, right? Short is going down. Long is going up. You can think about it in that way. Does that make sense? Long wouldn't really be going down, going up, right? Short is more going down, okay? So if we have a house price, house, house price is going up, then that's a long position. So long position, we want, we want this to happen, okay? Short position, we want this to happen. Is there anybody short on the housing market? Or is everybody long on the housing market? What do you think? Are there more people long or short in the housing market? More people want to go up and but some people if want to buy a house means want short. Yes. Goldman Sachs got into trouble about this. Do you know Goldman Sachs? Yes. They were telling all their people in 2007 in the US, buy houses. <laughs> right? This is true, right? They all went to the US court and they had to pay Big fine, big, very big fine, hundreds of millions of dollars. Because they were advising their customers, buy a house, now is a great time. <laughs> right? But they knew that the housing market was going to have a problem. So what did they do? They went and short the housing market. So Goldman Sachs made big bets that the house price was going to go down. So Goldman Sachs telling their customers one thing and doing a different transaction to the other thing is not allowed, that's illegal. Okay? If Goldman Sachs believe the housing market is going to go down, then they have to tell their customers, I think we think the house price will go down. Okay? They can't tell their customers one thing and believe another thing themselves. That's not an ethical business practice or legal. That's not legal business practice. Right? So there are ways to short the housing market. Okay? You can make a profit from the house price going down. Okay? You can short the stock market, you can short mainly using financial instruments. Okay? So, anyway, here we're talking about long positions and short positions for foreign currencies. So, let's 
uh, discuss about what's that. A long position, we talked about in the test, I'm getting British pounds. Do I want the pound to get stronger or weaker? I'm, I'm going to receive British pounds. Do I want it to get stronger or weaker? Stronger, okay? I want to get more dollars, right? So stronger pound will give me more dollars. So I expect to receive the foreign currency. It means I have an open long position, okay? I want to pay the foreign currency. Do I want the British pound to get weaker or stronger? Okay, I gave the example in Ireland before the euro. The chairman in the golf club took a loan in the Dutch krona because the Dutch currency was going to get weaker. So he took a loan in the Dutch currency and hopes that the Dutch currency will get weaker, right? Should he be gambling in the golf club like that? <laughs> if he was wrong, the golf club has a really big debt. If the Dutch currency gets stronger, it's going to be a lot more, really hard to pay back, right? But anyway, he was lucky, he was right. <laughs> it wasn't his money, right? It was the golf club's money. So people were happy, right? But he had a short position, open short position. We get a loan in the foreign currency. So if you listen to the, the, uh, the number one forecaster we saw in the news on Bloomberg, which currency should you get a loan in? Euros, right? He thinks the euro will get weaker. So he's saying get a loan in euros. So if companies are listening, then the company has a choice, get a loan in dollars or euros. Maybe I'll get a loan in euros. Does that make sense? Euro could get weaker, then I could. I have to pay back as much for the loan, right? Later. So that's called a short position. So we can remember it like this: long position, receiving the foreign currency. Okay, so you can write that down if it helps to remember, right? Short position, we have to pay the foreign currency. Okay, so we have account receivable, account payable. Account payable is that a long or short position? Short, pay short, okay, receive long, okay? Pay short, receive long. Accounts receivable, is that a long position or a short position? Long position, will you remember? Yes? Okay, so we have this risk. If we're, we have this open position, the foreign currency can move in a, in a direction, a strange direction, right? So, uh, for the long position, the risk is that the foreign currency will weaken. The British pound will weaken against the dollar. So when we, we change, we already looked at that example, right? We have 1.4, let's say um, 1.5, and 1.6. And we were getting pounds, 5 million pounds, right? So uh, this is the pound to the dollar. So this one is going to be stronger pound, uh, weaker pound, right? And this is going to be a stronger pound, okay? So, the, the pound got weaker, okay? We had a weaker pound. Then, five million pounds we have to pay. At this one, we have to pay seven million dollars. And then, at this one, eight million, eight million dollars. Okay. So if we are receiving, that was in the test we were paying, but in this case if we are receiving, uh, of long receiving the currency, we receive the currency at this exchange rate, we get less dollars. Are we happy? No. Here we receive more dollars. Are we happy? Yes. Yeah, so this is the risk. Okay. British pounds gets weaker and we, we receive less. Okay. The open short position. We expect to pay the foreign currency. The risk is that the currency will strengthen, the opposite. So if it's the opposite case, I need to pay pounds, like in the exam. This is the loss in the exam, right? We have to pay more dollars to get the pounds. So do you understand the risk of long and short? What's the risk for long? The foreign currency may weaken. Weaken. What's the risk for short? Foreign currency gets stronger, okay? So we already looked at that example earlier in the course and in the test, but let's do another example. Okay, so just try this uh, question. 
So assume we have a US-based multinational firm. They have an accounts receivable. Is receivable long or short position? Long. It's denominated in yen. Payment date is 30 days in the future. The invoice is this much yen. They're going to receive this much yen in 30 days. Okay? So assume the following outcomes. The spot rate changes to 95 or the spot rate changes to 82. Okay? Calculate the gain or loss in US dollars. So if you got the question right in the test, you should get this question right again, right? If you didn't get the question right in the test, some practice. Another similar type of question. three lines like this, right? Uh, 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6, we're going to have the different exchange rates, right? 82. Okay? And currently is 90. Okay? And then 95. Okay? So you've got these three situations. Okay? So how many dollars is this going to be? Right? At this exchange rate, how many dollars? At this exchange rate. At this exchange rate. Okay? Then what's the difference between this and this and this and this? That's going to be your gain and your loss. You don't have to do all the decimal points if you don't want. You can just do 90, 95, and 82. Okay? The answer will be roughly the same anyway. thing we need to do is, is this divide or multiply? Divide by 82 or multiply by 82? Divide by 82, right? So divided by 82, divided by 90, divided by 95, okay? Then we get our answers. Which one, next thing we need to say after we do the calculation, we get the numbers and the difference between this and this and this and this. Then what is the gain and what is the loss? Is this gain or is this a gain? 82. If we have a long, a long position, what's the risk? 
currency gets weaker or the currency gets stronger? Weaker. Weaker. So what's the which one is the currency getting? Weaker here. 95. 95. So that's the bad news, right? So this is the loss. And this one is going to be the gain. Okay? Stronger yen. Be the gain. So we should end up with this sort of a calculation, right? So 90 is 836,565. Then the yen weakens, it's going to be 790,000. So the yen weakens is here, 95, we said, okay? So we get this one minus this one, it's going to be 45,000 loss. Assume that FX rate goes to here, the yen gets stronger, we can gain 81,000, okay? So we already talked about this earlier in the course when we talked about exposure, okay? We said that it's, this can be the difference between the company making a profit or losing money. Maybe my profit was only 45,000 on this transaction, okay? If the exchange rate changed, I lost all my profit, okay? Of course, I could make a gain if I want to take a risk, but we already discussed for companies, they have, they have to pay workers, okay? They're not in big risky business. They want to be able to pay their suppliers, pay their workers and stay in business, okay? Rather than making just exceptional profit one time. So they like the stable situation. So we're, we'll just look at this, we're not going to do the calculation. This is a short position. So the US multinational firm has account payable, account payable short. What's the risk? Foreign currency gets stronger, okay? So here we have the British pound and the US dollar. Okay, the US dollar is home currency. So which one of these is the good British pound getting stronger? 158 or 142? 158, okay? This is, I can see very quickly, you should get used to that too, right? We have the pound or the yen and the dollar, right? The main currency is the euro. I know immediately that this one, I get more dollars for my pound, the pound is getting stronger. I get less dollars for my pound, the pound is getting weaker, okay? So try to get used to the pound and dollar and yen and so on, right? So you can quickly see what's happening. So this one is the pound getting stronger, so this one is going to be our risk. Okay, 158. So we can see that at 158, we could lose 421,000 on this transaction. Okay? The other one we can gain. So, do you have any question about that? It's just showing if we have an open position, there's a risk. Okay? And explaining the vocabulary of short and long. <coughs> so we can have different types of risk about the foreign exchange exposures. We have settlement value risk. Uh, the foreign currency denominated contracts and investments in the home currency equivalent can be adversely affected by changing exchange rates. So, example is bonds. Bond is a fixed income investment, okay? Uh, bank loans, accounts receivable. So this is the example, one of the example we just looked at here. We, may, we invested in bonds, we invested in, or we're getting paid by a foreign company, or we're paying a foreign company, and the exchange rate changes. Okay. Next one, future cash flow risk. Okay. Uh, here we have future revenues from ongoing multinational operations. So, I'm McDonald's. Do I know exactly how much my revenue is going to be in the future next year? Do I have a contract with all of my customers? They're going to buy five Big Macs next year. Do I, no, I don't make a contract with my customers. Okay, that's more cash flow. We didn't make a contract. We're not sure of the exact amount. Okay, but we are going to be getting revenues in a foreign currency. We're also going to have costs in a foreign currency. We may use more electricity or less electricity. We may need more staff or less staff. We're not sure. It's a change in cost. <clears throat> Next one is the global competitive risk. People 
often skip this one or don't think about this one as much. So I'm uh, working for Kia in Korea. Okay? I'm selling cars in Korea. So Korean won doesn't change against uh, US dollar, right? But I don't, let's say I don't do any business with Japan. Okay? Uh, I don't sell cars in Japan. Japanese don't sell cars in Korea. We have a bad relationship, for example. Okay? I do no business with Japan. Okay? And I sell cars to the US, and Japan sells cars to the US. Okay? Now the Japanese one suddenly gets weaker. But I don't have any suppliers from Japan. I have no contracts with Japan. Japanese companies is not in Korea. I'm not in Japan. Is the weaker yen going to affect me? Yes. Yes, why? Because we compete the US. Competing the US, right? Are people going to buy more or less Japanese cars? More Japanese cars. More Japanese cars. Are they going to buy more Toyotas or Kias? Toyotas, right? So this is a competitive uh, position. So we also have to think about our competitors. How does the exchange rate help or affect our competitors? Okay, so exporting firms uh, can be affected if the currencies of their overseas market weaken. It's more difficult to compete with domestic firms. So for example, if the US, the US currency weakens, right, our product key is more expensive. Costs for the US company is cheaper. Easier for them. Okay. Also, importing companies can also be affected if the currencies of the overseas market strengthen. We may, we may need to increase our home market selling price. So, I'm importing a part from China. The Chinese currency gets stronger. Okay. I'm going to have to increase the price of my product against the other company. Another company is not importing parts from China. They're importing parts from India. India currency didn't get stronger. Okay? Stayed the same. So just my part is getting more expensive, so I have to increase my price of my product. Okay? It's going to be less competitive. <coughs> so, do you understand the com global competitive risk? Yes. So, we talk about foreign exchange exposure in these main uh, types. Uh, transaction exposure, uh, just we talked about contractual arrangements. We make a contract like invoice or loans, bonds. Economic exposure, the future one, we talked about revenues and costs, costs and revenues that we're not sure about. And the final one we're not going to spend much time on, Translation exposure, it's accounting exposure. Accounting exposure, I have to make my accounts at the end of every year. Okay? According to my accounts, I own a factory in Argentina. Argentinian currency got a lot weaker. The value of the factory is less on my assets. Okay? It's not as important because I'm not going to sell the factory anyway. Next year the price might come back up again. Okay? So that's a, also called accounting exposure. So transaction exposure, the one we talked about. Accounts receivable. Okay? Financial asset like a bond or stocks. Accounts payable. Okay? A loan. We make a loan in a foreign currency. That, do you understand transaction? Transaction is like contracts. Okay? Buying and selling. So... Uh, <coughs> Here we have the incident of exporting and importing transaction exposure by the global firm home country. So we can see that uh, the US makes a lot of their contracts in US dollars. Across the world, makes US dollars important. A lot of US, 96% of the US exporting contracts is made in sorry, US dollars. So. If you make a contract with the US company, what currency is the contract going to be in? Probably. Hmm? Probably US dollars, right? 
Why do you think the US company might not want to make a contract in Korean one? Korean one is the very less kids and US dollar is the very stable. Right? So you're going to have to deal with the risk a bit more than the US company, right? Imports, they're a little bit more flexible. Okay? Exports, they're getting paid. Imports, they're paying you. A little bit more flexible when they're paying you, right? We can see imports every. If, so it depends whether you're the buyer or the seller, right? If I'm the exporter, I want to get paid in my own currency, right? But if I'm importing, I may agree to pay in the other currency, right? We can see that trend on all of the, all of the cases, okay? Uh, Germany, also using euro, France, euro, UK, slightly less. Japan, less important. So we already said the US dollar, the euro, the main currencies in the world, right? Uh, I guess Korea is going to be a good bit lower than this, right? Maybe less than 20% of contracts will be made in your home currency. So most of the contracts are made in dollars or euros or yen. So you have to think about uh, that kind of transaction exposure. Then the economic exposure. Uh, this is resulting from the physical entry of a global firm in a foreign country. Physical entry means FDI, setting up a factory, setting up an office in another country, setting up a manufacturing area. So this is the long-term foreign exchange exposure, okay? resulting from FDI location decision. We decided to go to India, we decided to go to China, we decided to go to Argentina. Okay? So, we can find that some Korean companies might be regretting that a few years ago they chose China and not India. Why? Because maybe the Chinese currency got stronger, right? So the cost of, is higher for them now. Wages are higher in China. You understand wages? Yes. Salaries are higher. Land is more expensive if they want to expand. Land is more expensive, okay? Imports are more expensive. So we already made our decision, and then we're going to be affected by the uh, <coughs> exchange rate. McDonald's decided to go to Argentina in 2001, set up in Argentina. Then, suddenly, the Argentinian currency gets very weak. Is McDonald's happy about their decision, or would they have preferred to go to Afghanistan? than Argentina. Maybe not Afghanistan, right? but maybe another country. Okay? Maybe it was a bad decision to go to Argentina. The currency got so much weaker, we're not making much profit now. Okay? So, we're not going to make much profit next year. So this is economic exposure. So it affects the firm through contracts and transactions which have not happened yet, but will in the future. It's unknown today. We don't know how much the salaries will cost in the future or the revenues will be in the future. So the <coughs> this is a little bit more difficult to hedge. Transaction exposure, a little bit easier. Forward contracts, right? Economic exposure, we're getting more difficult. Translation exposure, we're translating financial statements from foreign currencies to local currencies. Okay, so we're not going to worry about this one. This is about the financial statements. Not as it's not as big a risk as in that it's a long, more long-term thing, which is affects accounting. So discuss with your partner what is the difference between transaction exposure and uh, economic exposure.
Both of them have the risk of the foreign exchange changing, but the risk is slightly different. What's the difference? not discussing the question, right? Just they uh, just sit there in silence and don't discuss with their partner, right? <laughs> so uh, it's an advantage for both people, right? You might have one student who is a little bit weaker than the other student, doesn't know as well, right? We can see in the exam score, right? But the weaker student gets advantage because the stronger student explains the answer to them, okay? The stronger student also gets advantage because if you explain something, you remember it much better. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Even though you think you know, if you explain something, you remember better for the future. Okay? So we should be discussing, even if you know the answer, if you explain the answer, it helps you to understand better by explaining and remember better. Okay? So that's the kind of uh, object we want when we discuss these kinds of questions. Okay. So, uh, Trey came in. Well, contract is the correct word to use for transaction exposure, right? So we have the current contracts that we're dealing with. But in the future, we might have a contract, right? Like I said, McDonald's doesn't make contracts with its customers about the revenues, okay? It doesn't know now how many staff it's going to need in February. It doesn't already have all those contracts finished, okay? It hasn't already made a contract with the electricity company.